So I'm Suren Vaina from CRD and welcome to this uh, week's C CS Nurse Data Seminar. Today's speaker is uh, Dr. Gokul Padhyayala. And Gokul is an assistant professor at, in the Department of Molecular Cell Biology at UC Berkeley. And he's also the scientific director of the Advanced Bioimaging Center. He did his PhD at uh, UC Riverside and did his uh, postdoctoral research at uh, Harvard Medical School and uh, Boston's Children's Hospital. Uh, I came to know about Gokul and his fascinating research in light, lattice light sheet uh, microscopy during a recent LDRD review, uh, thanks to Hans. Uh, and uh, we had several discussions with him about uh, data management and analysis challenges in his field, which are very relevant to this uh, se seminar series. Without further ado, uh, I, uh, I welcome uh, Gokul to take over the Zoom, cha uh, Zoom channel. Uh, thanks, Seren, for the, the introduction, uh, and thanks everyone for, for taking the time to, to be here and just listen to my, my, my one hour rant about what we're doing and how much help we need from, especially from the, the, the engineers and the, and the computer scientists and the data scientists and, and, and the crowd over here. So um, the past six years have been, uh, for me, at the intersection of engineering, um, uh, building new instruments. Um, using them to study some fundamental biological questions, which um, I'm going to touch on just very briefly at a very high level today. Um, and the idea is how can we now visual, uh, visualize and extract biologically meaningful information from, from these data sets. So um, this is, uh, I'm going to start with an analogy that, that kind of just really um, just blew my mind when I first heard it, um, which is basically like trying to understand how life works without clearly watching it in action is like an alien species trying to understand the rules of a football game from just a few pictures. I mean, don't get me wrong, we've learned a lot this way, but it's hard to piece together how the rules um, of the game work from just a couple of snapshots. And the same thing applies to life. And much of what we know about how life works comes from scientists, scientists being able to piece together from a lot of different source, these fuzzy and, and fragmented snapshots so that they can understand the rules of, of the fundamental unit of life, uh, which is the cell. So how can we watch this particular cell to understand how it works? Um, the easiest way is to make the invisible visible. And we typically do this um, using microscopes. Now, a typical microscope uh, that most people use for live images delivers anywhere from 10 to 10,000 times uh, the sun's light that we're exposed to on the Earth's surface where life actually evolved. So we need to be careful about how much light we put in because we can end up with a deep fried cell, so to speak, uh, and there's nothing natural about trying to watch uh, the behavior of, of damaged cells um, whose behavior is really physiologically altered. And this is why we as the cell paparazzi um, work really hard to collect images to capture these cells in their natural environment, to, to observe their natural behavior. And to limit um, photo damage to cells, our lab uses something called the lattice light sheet microscopy that came from Eric Betz's, Betzig's group uh, about six, seven years ago. And with this microscope, what we were able to do is we were able to shine a very thin sheet of light to be able to minimize any risk of damage to cells. Uh, and it also lets us see what's going on inside the cells uh, for much longer uh, without stressing them out. So before I kind of dive a lot more into detail, I just want to kind of give you an a intuitive understanding of, of what it is that um, is unique about this imaging modality. So you can take the cell on this cover slip, for example. And if I want to image any of the uh, dynamics of the cell on the attached surface at the interface of the cover slip, uh, turf microscopy um, is probably the best tool I have available to me because uh, if you can see the red illumination, that's more or less confined within this brown depth of focus, meaning that my contrast is incredibly great and I have very uh, good sensitivity and very low phototoxicity because I'm only putting in light where I'm observing the dynamics. But if I want to image anywhere other than the bottom or the next to the cover slip, I need to do some sort of a three-dimensional sectioning of this particular cell. And we do this by focusing light using a confocal scanner, where it focuses a, a, a point of light at the depth of focus, and then we can move the depth of focus up and down to be able to capture uh, the three-dimensional volume of the cell. And of course, you can multiplex this in something called a spinning disk, where you have multiple pins of, uh, pinholes of light. 
Um, and we're basically able to multiplex uh, and speed up the capturing of, of this particular uh, two-dimensional section. So uh, one thing you should have noticed is that for every single two-dimensional image we collect this way, we're putting in light the entire um, volume of the cell. So basically, if we're just focusing the light, but the light goes through the entire cell. So that means that the amount of light that this particular cell sees is proportional to the number of three-dimensional images or the two-dimensional images that you collect to generate a three-dimensional volume. And light sheet technology has been pretty um, 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 mature in the field. Um, they've, what they typically do is use um, two objectives where one, uses, um, uh, one is used for ex exciting or generating the light sheet, meaning that the light sheet comes from, in this case, the left objective. And it comes through and you're ab basically able to observe um, and collect and record uh, the, the signals in the depth of focus of the objective on the right, which is the detection objective. This has been transformative for developmental biology, where you're able to observe most of the, the high level processes um, at the cellular level resolution, meaning that you can look at where the cells are, how they're moving, but it's very difficult to be able to observe what's happening um, um, in the, inside the cells. And this um, changed more or less um, uh, with the lattice light sheet. And the way we did that is um, by basically creating a super thin sheet of light uh, that's almost entirely confined within the depth of focus. So you have great contrast. You basically don't waste any of the, your photon budget uh, putting a light into the, into, the, into the cells. And just to kind of give you an intuitive sense as to what this looks like. So this is a cross section of a, a single um, uh, beam inside of the lattice slice sheet. Uh, a single beam is called a Bessel beam in this case. Um, as you can see, there's like this energy from, you know, um, originating from the, the central order and it's kind of basically, you know, have this ring uh, pattern that goes basically beyond. So using a single Bessel by itself is still a terrible choice uh, because of this particular higher orders of intensity, which more or less diminishes our, our ability to, to resolve or, you know, uh, decreases the contrast. And that was um, basically when we uh, found out that by placing these beams uh, at very specific periods, what you do is you have maximal confinement or interference and destruction um, of the higher order such that most of the energy is basically confined within the depth of focus. Of course, this still doesn't look like a, a light sheet um, from its cross section. So what we do is we just move a mirror fast enough, faster than what, how we take a picture in order to blur that to create an artificial light sheet. And of course, um, if you want super resolution instead of uh, sweeping it back and forth very fast, we can take advantage by moving the mirror very slowly to be able to take advantage of modulations in the signal for super resolution um, light sheet imaging. So what does that mean um, um, as, a, as a consequence to us? So here you're looking at um, the same cells uh, uh, in two different microscopes. So in the first case, we're looking at a spinning disc confocal microscope, which is basically in almost every um, cell biologist's lab or the cell biologist department's um, uh, imaging core facility. Um, and what we've done is we've imaged the, this particular cell. So let me tell you what the cell is. So the cell um, is a genome edited cell that's showing you how uh, we can, uh, um, uh, how the cells um, eat, meaning that they basically are able to build uh, something called a clathrin uh, coated vesicle, meaning that at the plasma membrane, you have molecules that appear. Uh, these molecules tend to accumulate to self-assemble into a basket. Uh, and at the end of this particular process, they basically bring in anything, any food, any reagents, any, any molecules from outside the cell into the cells uh, by breaking free from, from the plasma membrane. And that's basically what we're observing in this particular case. We're watching this particular process. Uh, and you'll basically see new spots appear and disappear. But now watch what happens if I'm imaging um, at the same um, uh, ending signal to noise, uh, same signal to noise, um, um, watch what happens. Basically within about 30 stacks, most of my signal goes away in my spinning disk because the amount of power that I'm putting in is uh, more than an order of magnitude more in terms of total light dose that's been delivered to the cell on the top versus the bottom. As a consequence, you're damaging the, the basically the fluorescent proteins and you're basically making them go dark. So we're no longer able to observe them using a fluorescence microscope. 
So that's basically the, the, the transformative nature of this is that we're now able to image much faster. We're able to image with a great level of sensitivity uh, with very minimal photo damage to the cells. So using this microscope, we've kind of dwelled at, um, uh, dive deep into lots of different um, fundamental problems that exist in cell biology. So starting at the top left, we've looked at um, how uh, cells eat. So in this case, we're putting in toxins to see how the toxins, um, like in this particular case, shiga toxin that is basically prone to a lot of um, diarrheal problems. How does that actually get into the cell? Trying to understand the fundamental mechanism of that. Um, on the, the top middle, uh, we've looked at how rotavirus, um, in this particular case, um, is trying to infect this particular cell. So we've um, basically exposed this particular cell to lots of <clears throat> Uh, particles, these are pseudoparticles, which means that we make them inside the lab uh, without the genetic components on the inside, but outside of the virus looks exactly similar to a wild type virus. So we're basically trying to understand how they behave on the surface of the cell, how they're moving around, how they basically disassemble themselves and inject uh, themselves into, uh, to, to basically gain access into the cells. Um, anything that you eat needs to get digested. Uh, so we're looking at mechanisms at which how um, the molecules are more or less broken down into their, their elemental components um, uh, through something called escort dynamics, where you're looking at the process of generating these digestive vesicles. Um, anything that is produced in the cells uh, needs to be um, more or less trafficked and shipped to the right place. So basically we're looking at, okay, how to, Basically, how does the FedEx work uh, inside the cell? FedEx and UPS, so to speak. Um, all of the, the examples, the four examples I've talked about so far, these are of single cells on a piece of glass. Um, and uh, we've been able to observe them with great level of detail. But what happens if you want to now observe cells, but in their native physiological environment? And what I mean by that is, uh, as part of a cell cluster, is in, in a tissue or, or inside a, a living organism. Uh, and that's basically what I want to tell you about today, which is basically, this is the advance that we've made uh, a few years ago uh, to be able to observe with the same level of detail as we can uh, with cells on cover slips. Uh, and the last example I want to kind of convey is, well, let's forget life, for example. If you really want to be able to look at something in extraordinary detail, can we develop a technology that's scalable in terms of uh, super resolution? Because most super resolution techniques are, are limited to pretty small volumes um, uh, and mostly two-dimensional in, 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 in many cases. Uh, so we want to be able to do three-dimensional super resolution that's scalable to not just cells, but to large tissues. And I'll, I'll tell you about that um, towards the end of my, end of my talk. And, and please feel free to, to stop and, and ask questions if something uh, makes no sense, because uh, I think that will benefit, benefit me to know uh, where to kind of focus in, 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 in my explanations. So I want to start back up again with the example of um, clathrin mediated endocytosis, which is uh, again the process of by which the cells, how the cells eat. So we were able to capture for the first time, I guess, in in in, in our history, uh, the ability to observe these dynamics in three dimensions, uh, to be able to detect them um, in in three D, and to be able to track these processes um, as they originate, um, as they mature, and as they basically decay. Um, and we are able to not just, you know, collect these videos, but uh, we put in a lot of effort in trying to create um, tools to be able to mine this data because it tells us something super important. Like, for example, when we're observing um, these, um, these uh, eating processes, so to speak, so each spot is more or less a, a, an individual process of how um, the different regions of the cells are eating. We see a, a lot of heterogeneity in how they, how they actually behave. So if I'm basically trying to quantify this, uh, we're looking at, okay, first, how long do these spots last? So you have a huge heterogeneity between, you know, short-lived guys versus long-lived guys. And we have very similar behaviors between the top of the cell versus the bottom of the cell, which is cool. Um, but this really tells us in terms of um, how particles get in. Uh, this has to do with, well, in this particular case, uh, these objects may be abortive, meaning that they started to build, but more or less they had uh, no signal or, or no components that got captured into these vesicles, so they may have aborted. Uh, so most likely the, the short-lived guys are, are called abortives. Uh, and the long-lived guys, uh, there's one of two reasons why they last this long. One is memory tension, meaning that 
the membrane is so tense that it takes them a lot of force that they need to generate in order to create the curvature in order to cause the, the, the vesicle to, to close. Uh, the other reason we see this is uh, when something large gets stuck. Like for example, a virus is hijacking this particular machinery to get into the cells. Uh, in that case, uh, the, the lifetime of these events um, increases as well. So we're able to basically you know, observe over 250,000 of these events to basically create like one of the first kind of um, robust and, and, um, and, and detailed kind of descriptions of, okay, how these um, objects behave as a, as a cohort. Now that was a single cell on a piece of glass, just one cell. So the goal is, okay, we want to go more physiological. And this is the, the work that got published a couple of years ago. Um, and we started with a collaboration with um, David Drubin's group and, and Dara Kockemeyer's group at, uh, at the UC Berkeley in the MCV department. And what they've generated are these organoid membranes, uh, which are basically labeled in, in red for the same molecules that I was showing you in the previous slide. Uh, these are organoids, meaning that they're three-dimensional cell systems um, that are super incredibly complex in their interactions because you have cell-cell interactions and then you have intracell um, interactions. Uh, and they're embedded in this um, uh, physiological matrix called matrigel. Um, as you can see, you don't see those clear spots anymore. And there's a, a reason for this um, because any of the light that's kind of coming through, which is the yellow, that's the excitation, uh, because of the curvature of the sample, that's basically first bent. And second, as it's propagating through to the region where we're imaging, which is the red box there, uh, it's getting scrambled. The light is getting scrambled. Uh, anything you do manage to excite, um, you basically have the, the blue light going back to the detection objective. That is also getting scrambled, but in a slightly different way because it's taking a different path to the objective. Uh, and because the yellow light bent relative to the depth of focus, uh, these two objectives are no longer in focus. That means that we need to fix both uh, the excitation scrambling problem, the detection light scram scrambling problem, and the focus um, between the two objectives. So, uh, how do we do that? So I've shown you the cross-section of what an ideal light sheet looks like. Uh, this is what we start with. Uh, and we measure, okay, how does it aberrate? Uh, so you can see that the light sheet is starting to bloom a little bit. That means that you're no longer putting in the same flux of energy into the same region. Uh, so we need to correct this. And the way we do that is we use something called a Shack-Hartman wavefront sensor. All that does is it measures the aberration. Uh, in Fourier space, and then we subtract that and then inverse transform and put it back into something called a spatial light modulator, which is basically what an LCD projector's um, chips are. Uh, and we're able to recover uh, the lost, uh, I guess, uh, recover from the, the aberration of the, the excitation side. For the detection side, it's slightly different. Uh, what we do is we use something that astronomers have developed over 50 years ago, actually. Um, and we use something called a guide star approach. So the problem is uh, from astronomers who figured this out, they were trying to observe the light from uh, distant galaxies coming basically more or less unaltered up until it hits our upper atmosphere. In the stratosphere, more or less, uh, you're starting to scramble from the, the, the humidity, from basically you know, all of the, the clouds and, and, and the, our atmosphere is basically scrambling the light, causing it to look pretty blurry. So what they do is basically they've been able to generate something called um, a guide star. So right near the region of the star that they're trying to image, uh, they basically shoot a laser up from a ground-based telescope to create a, a, a guide star by exciting sodium atoms in our stratosphere. So the strat basically uh, in the same region as to the region that um, as, as the, the stars that they're trying to observe. And what they're doing is they're basically seeing, okay, how does the light from this guide star come back through the atmosphere um, and what they can do is they have this deformable mirror element that can physically change its shape to compensate for this, you know, aberrated wavefront to be able to correct it. And we have this like feedback loop system. Uh, and by doing this particular correction, they're basically able to recover the loss resolution. So uh, the, the astronomers have been doing this um, you know, for, for many decades now. And what we've done in the, in the past, um, a uh, few years is be able to adapt this into the light of the light sheet microscope. Uh, and when we do this, um, oh, I'm sorry, before I get to that. So the last problem is the, is the focus correction. So what we do is we shine light between, you know, from both objectives and we see, okay, where does it focus? 
And then we have a fast moving mirror that's able to compensate by basically overlapping these two orange and, and, and blue lights. And when we do this, um, we're able to take this aberrated sample and then recover the lost resolution. So that's the difference between a, a, a conventional microscope versus what we can do is now we're able to correct um, for these aberrations using adaptive optics. Uh, and by doing so, we now enabled, again, the quantitative abilities of, of being able to observe more complex samples and start to kind of start to study them. So this is a, a complex sample in the context that it's a three-dimensional cell cluster, but it's still not a living organism. So we took this one step further. We basically are able to apply this um, to imaging zebrafish. So zebrafish is, is awesome because they're vertebrates, just like humans. Uh, but unlike humans, they're mostly transparent. That means that uh, they don't scatter or block the, the light. Um, but they do aberrate because the refractive index of each of the cells um, is slightly different. So that bend, basically that bends the light in, in slightly different ways. So when the light passes through, you know, through the top of the, the skin of the, the zebrafish until it gets to the, basically the middle of the zebrafish where we're trying to image, uh, the light is more or less scrambled, both in the excitation side and the detection side. And that's basically what I'm showing you is what it looks like without um, correction and with correction in this particular case. And to give you a context of scale, this is a single cell that I showed you early on. Uh, now, basically, you can start to imagine our, our data production rates and our, our computability uh, problem basically uh, compounds a little bit. But before I kind of dive deep into the, the, those problems, I want to kind of give you a flavor as to what it is that we're able to observe now. So now that we're not just interested in the cellular dynamics, but we're more focused on the subcellular uh, dynamics in these, um, in these zebrafish. So again, keeping in the context of how cells eat, we're looking at the same particular process uh, in these particular tissues where you're looking at how um, the green spots that will appear in just a second how they uh, basically function in terms of dynamics uh, in different regions or different tissues of the fish. And what we found is that um, the brain cells tend to eat much, eat much faster than the muscle cells. Uh, and we sort of know un and understand the reasons for this. Um, and that's because the muscle cells have a much higher membrane tension uh, than, than most of the, the brain cells do. So this was a, a cool observation that we were able to make um, uh, really uh, inside a living organism that was, that was never observed before. Uh, so we can also look at not just um, you know, diffraction limited spots, which are those little spots that you were looking at for the clapping, but more complex shapes. Um, part of the problem with this is how do you visualize this? This is like one of the, our bigger problems is that um, this particular movie that you're looking at is uh, maybe about 200 gigabytes or 300 gigabytes. Um, and there are, uh, again, each single volume is relatively small, but we have three different channels uh, with multiple time steps. So to be able to visualize this, um, what we've done is instead of looking at a slab by slab basis, we now basically try to augment the visualization by bringing in some of the analysis tools that we have. So the first thing we do is uh, we segment because we're, we can delineate the boundaries of the cells because we have a membrane marker. And then we computationally just take them apart. So when we take them apart, uh, we're basically reducing the complexity of our visualization problems. Uh, and we're able to now uh, visualize each cell as an individual component. But more interestingly, now you're able to observe, okay, the morphology of these cells, the shapes, the dynamics, all um, in the context of this particular tissue. So you can see the precursor uh, neuronal cells in the back. You can see those columnar structures. The mitotic cells are these round blobs there. And the skin cells on the top are these amorphous blobs. Uh, in a second, I'll turn off everything except for one cell so we can look at it in a lot more detail. Uh, but ideally, we can basically do this with any cell in this particular tissue volume. So that's the same cell here. Uh, but now here, I'm more interested in understanding how the organelles inside of each of these cells is distributing or changing its distribution over time. So we're watching the cell. Um, and what we've done is basically we've segmented out and then we're now looking at just the one cell. We're looking at the Golgi that's inside in the green. We're looking at how the mitochondria that's responsible for generating all the power to, you know, power more or less all the actions of the cell um, is distributed in the, in the cell and the endoplasmic reticulum where all the new proteins are synthesized. We're looking at the organization of all of these proteins. Uh, and we're basically plotting that as a, as a function of distance from the plasma membrane to see how much and how they're basically um, organizes a cumulative uh, uh, frequency distribution. 
So as I play the movie, you'll also see okay, how the volume of the cell changes and how the surface area of the cell changes. Uh, and this particular uh, tissue we're imaging basically in the brain of the zebrafish at about 14 hours post fertilization. So more or less the organelles are evenly distributed when they started. Uh, and this cell, what it's going to do in just a few minutes, so to speak, um, is it's going to divide. Uh, that means that it's going to replicate and, and basically, you know, generate uh, two identical copies of itself. So as um, it enters the division phase, it starts to round up. Uh, when it rounded up, you saw that the mitochondria are more peripheral than the other two organelles uh, because it's excluding that from basically the, the nuclear region. And when the, basically the cell rounded up, the surface area dropped. Um, and when the cell, uh, the volume, of course, doesn't change. And then when the cells finish dividing, the surface area recovers when you're summing the, two, the surface area of the two daughter cells. And then the organelles start to then redistribute um, into, their, into their even distribution as, as we saw in the very beginning. Um, the other cool thing is that we're able to observe things that were more or less never seen before. So this is an example of, of one of those, um, those examples where you're basically able to look at not just the cells, but the behavior of this. So in this case, um, I'll show you one example of something called cascading divisions that we've never uh, you know, really have been able to see uh, before because this is now a product of cells communicating with their neighbor. So in this particular case, this cell just went through division and the cell that's connected to it, but I just separated physically, um, is now uh, under, is, is gonna say, hey, you went through division, I'm gonna go through division as well. So that started to round up. And then I want to just rotate so that you're able to see uh, the juxtaposed cell to it. Uh, and as this finishes division, uh, the cell next to it um, starts to enter into, into mitosis and start to divide. So, so these are the types of examples um, of, of novel behaviors that we're able to observe as a consequence of, of observing life in its native state. Um, so everything I've shown you is a single field of view. Um, I want to now be able to image large fields of view, like as in we want to have the same amount of sensitivity, resolution, but I want to be able to look at, say, an entire organ, for example. So for that, um, it's, it's, a, it's a more or less, a, 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 again, the microscopy challenge is that if you don't use adaptive optics, if I'm looking at the regions in the, the orange that are zoomed in and, or the blue that are zoomed in, it kind of looks more or less fuzzy. Um, we can use adaptive optics, but we need to now say, you know, only apply it to a small region, which is the, the, the box in, in orange. So if you measure the aberration there and you apply and you correct it, you're able to now see features that you weren't able to before with that adaptive optics. But if you apply the incorrect correction, uh, it's possible to make things much worse than they were uh, without any correction, which is the blue box in this case. So it's important to recognize when do you need to correct and when do you not need to correct. So in that case, you need to understand how the light is aberrating, um, and that's exactly what we've done. So we've been able to um, break the, the imaging sessions into smaller regions where we can individually measure. Uh, and just to help you kind of visualize aberrations, um, if you have a perfectly flat potato chip, that means there's no aberration. But if the potato chip shape becomes more and more complex, that means you have higher orders of aberration that we need to be able to correct. And these are um, the Zernike polynomial unit disks that we're kind of more or less measuring. Um, so in this case, we've imaged about 100 uh, different volumes in this particular um, movie. And I want to basically show you what the aberration looks like. So these are the, the individual uh, small units that we've imaged, and then we stitched it back together. So you can see that there's um, aberrations that are basically regionally uh, dependent, meaning that on the left side of the movie, you have much worse aberrations than the, the right side of the, of the particular volume. And this is the excitation light sheet. And if I'm looking at the same thing in the detection, um, it's different because again, they're taking two separate light paths in order to get to where, where um, uh, to be able to collect the, the image. So that's the reason we need to break this down into smaller chunks that we are able to correct and then stitch it back together. So it's a, again, another computational challenge after we've acquired the data. So in this particular case, again, looking at the organelle dynamics, uh, this is the field of view for one such uh, region of interest. Uh, here we're imaging the eye of the zebrafish, but we need to correct smaller chunks of the, the regions of the eye of the zebrafish. 
So we collect about 48 separate volumes to be able to reconstruct the entire eye uh, while we're correcting each one uh, for using adaptive optics independently. Uh, then we do the registration and the stitching uh, to be able to bring this data back. Um, and just to give you a, a sense of the size of this particular uh, data set is uh, close to one and a half terabytes or so. Uh, and we have three separate channels that um, we're able to observe uh, to look at, okay, the dynamics of what's happening in the eye. So not only do we have the, the resolution to, to look at the, the cell, the morphology, but we're also able to follow the dynamics of what's happening inside of the, each of these cells. Um, and again, I'm only showing you a small slab of this, just, just so that you can kind of understand that. And these are just single planes of that particular uh, stitched volume that we're able to observe. So in a second, <clears throat> um, what I'll do is basically show you the volume representation and then take it completely apart like we've done in the other data sets just so that we can kind of evaluate the morphology of each of these cells uh, in their context. So basically you can look at the, the, the retinal cells. Those are the columnar, columnar cells. And towards the edge of the movie on the left side, you can basically see the skin cells. These are those flat um, blobs. This is another mitotic cell uh, in, the, in the retina. And in a second, when we get to the cornea, you'll see that the shape of those, of those cells is completely, um, uh, uh, completely more or less uh, amorphous um, in a second. So you'll see these um, amorphous blobs. So from these type of data sets, what we're basically trying to understand uh, is, for example, how do you differentiate different cells to know whether they're uh, cells that belong in the cornea, the cells that belong in the, the retina or the skin. So when we're looking at these um, cell divisions, um, as the cells are starting to divide, you'll see that um, these, um, these retinal cells that, that um, are more or less kind of attached to both sides of this particular um, apical and basal uh, retina, what happens is when the cell is starting to go through division, it still maintains its contact, but it moves the nucleus to one side and then the cell divides, uh, while this particular cell, uh, daughter cell, basically now re-expands. However, this particular second daughter cell is now more or less free to roam around the cabin, so to speak, uh, in order to find its path uh, as to what it wants to do and what it wants to be. So these are the, the things that we're able to now observe in exquisite um, detail. Uh, in the last example of this particular data set, what I want to show you is um, how we can observe cells moving, um, again, in, in, in a living organism. So here we're imaging cancer. So green cells are human breast cancer cells that we've injected into the zebrafish to understand how they move around uh, to understand metastasis of cancer. So in this case, we can see two examples of, of uh, these cells. In one case on the left, it's squeezing through these blood vessels that are in magenta. Uh, in the other case, you can see them more or less rolling on top of these blood vessels. Um, and you can see like the, 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 the more or less the hooks and the claws of this, those green strands that they generate um, in their wake as they kind of roll through. And in fact, in one of these examples, we were able to catch one of these cancer cells trying to extravasate out of a blood vessel. And basically this is how uh, they, they circulate in the blood vessels and then they basically try to get out at a different stop, so to speak. So that's how they, they start to, to metastasize from one region of the body to a different region of the body. And we know that it's trying to get out of this particular blood vessel because if you track the surface area outside of the blood vessel, it increases over a course of, say, two hours by almost 50%. It increases. So this is like one example of, of looking at, you know, um, now, now you can imagine doing this in a high throughput setting where you now treat it with different uh, therapeutics, different interventions, drugs, so forth, to understand, okay, how, does this, how is this process uh, uh, mitigated? Um, another example we can look at is how does your immune system, um, you know, basically move to, to fight infections? So you can see these immune cells crawling around. Um, and what we've done is uh, we're trying to understand, okay, how the immune cells are sensing their environment. So what we've done is we injected this particular um, fish with um, a fluorescently labeled sugar, which is dextran in this case. Uh, and you'll see that in this one case, this particular cell doesn't necessarily sense its environment, 
but there's another neutrophil that's crawling around with more or less you know, blue gems in its belly, so to speak, uh, because that's constantly sensing its environment to understand, okay, where it needs to go. Um, and then um, more or less, this is a neutrophil that's um, trying to understand you know, what, um, whether or not there's a existential threat to, to this organism. Um, and in this, in this, again, the same field of view, uh, the amazing thing is that we're able to observe about 11 different cell types um, and ob ob observing basically what's happening. So you can see the immune cells crawling. Uh, we can see how a pressure relief valve, which I'm not gonna talk about right now, but um, how that's basically kind of assembling itself. A mitotic endothelial cell to basically you know, extend your, your blood vessels. You have the hindbrain on the bottom uh, to be able to understand how those neurons are, are, are behaving. And all of this in, in a single field of view. So basically what we've developed uh, is a technology that lets us record dynamics at the scale of nanometers and milliseconds, um, determine their consequences at the scale of microns and minutes, uh, to be able to visualize uh, their long-term outcome at the scale of uh, you know, several millimeters uh, over you know, hours or, or even days. And we can do all of this quantitatively in multicellular organisms uh, with uh, basically diffraction limited resolution. That means that in, with the, uh, the objectives and the numerical apertures that we're using, we have the ability to look at subcellular structures uh, inside of these transparent organisms. And with the right reagents, we really do have uh, close to single molecule sensitivity. So that's more or less um, the, uh, the advance in microscopy um, in terms of the live imaging. Um, I want to switch gears very briefly to tell you a little bit about our efforts to, um, to basically apply um, this microscopy tool, but for observing large tissues with super resolution. And in this case, uh, what we're doing is we're combining the lattice light sheet with something called expansion microscopy. So let me tell you what expansion microscopy is. So expansion microscopy is the ability to chemically prepare your sample such that you physically expand it. As in, if it's hard for me to see the details, well, I'll make the sample larger. So it's kind of like the, the philosophy of, well, uh, it's hard to beat the laws of physics so we can go around them. In this case, we're basically using um, uh, sample preparation techniques in order to um, infuse um, these samples with what's similar to in baby diapers. It's a swellable resin. Um, and when we basically remove all the salts, uh, this uh, polymer network that we've infused this particular sample with will expand. And the cool thing is that it expands isotropically so we can control that expansion factor. So for most of the, the rest of the images, I'm just gonna show you, um, it's going to be about 4X expansion. That means that we're basically able to see or increase our resolution of our, of our imaging by about a factor of four. So why do we need to combine it with lattice light sheet? Why not the traditional tools that are, are available right now? Um, well, for first, um, if you want to use existing tools, uh, for example, say AeriScan, that'll take you a better part of a year to be able to image a millimeter cubed volume. Uh, if you use something called a spinning disk, uh, you more or less bleach out most of your volume even before you're done imaging. Um, and with the lattice, we kind of circumvent both of these problems because we have um, low phototoxicity and we have high speed. So we're basically able to image a, a millimeter cube uh, within, you know, in, 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 in about a week or so. So what does this look like? So if I zoom into one of these regions uh, with the, the neurons, we're able to basically observe um, a lot of the, the details that we weren't able to see before with just diffraction limited imaging. So in this case, um, we're able to look at all the compartments within this particular neuron because we labeled everything except for the components. So we're segmenting the voids. Um, and we're able to, you know, of course, you know, quantify the, the shapes of these things, you know, look at the volumes, um, the major and minor axes. Uh, we're able to understand, okay, well, what of these particular structures are what com compartments? So we're able to identify which ones are mitochondria, which ones are, are, are lysosomes, and then we can then start to look at different regions of the, of the neurons. So in this case, we're looking, looking at the dendrites, the axons, and the somas, meaning those are the different structures of the neuron. And we can look at, okay, how these, the shapes um, vary. So in this case, you'll see that um, in the axons, uh, uh, basically that's, that's transmitting the electrical signals in the, in the brain, um, they're 
lack large mitochondria. They only have relatively smaller mitochondria compared to the, the soma, which is the body of the neuron, or the dendrites, the extensions of these, um, of these neurons. And that's one field of view that tells us you know, information, but it doesn't give us everything we need to know. So we need to be able to image much larger fields of view. So in this case, we went out to map an entire cortical column, which is that blue region in the, in the schematic. It's just that little stripe right there. So we're basically imaging that particular volume, but it more or less took us about 60,000 volumetric tiles to stitch together this particular um, volume imaging from the surface all the way to the, the white matter and in that small strip. Um, so this, uh, we were able to image again with super resolution um, and this particular data set took about 17 hours to image, but we're able to you know, more or less visualize the entire somatosensory cortex cortical column um, in this particular case. And to give you a sense of what the data looks like, so we're looking at the pre and the postsynaptic uh, positions in this particular data set. Those are the magenta and the blue. And I'm gonna turn off everything that's not strictly associated with the neurons that we're directly observing. Uh, so here you're only looking at 10% of all of the neurons. So that's the reason it looks more or less empty because we're only looking at one out of every 10 neurons that are there. So the complexity is more or less you know, mind boggling to say the least. Uh, but the cool thing here is that you can see that the blue, uh, the cyan and the, and the magenta are juxtaposed next to each other. Uh, so those are the pre and the postsynaptic uh, regions. Um, and what the cool thing is, is that in this particular data set, we were able to measure the three dimensional distances between those two uh, markers for, to understand, okay, how do you transmit the information from one um, axon to more or less one um, of the, the spines that's, that's um, that's there. And in this one data set, we're able to observe more than a hundred times um, uh, the data points that were more or less reported in all of literature. So we're able to look at about 25,000 um, uh, thousand of these objects and be able to more or less um, extract out their different, I mean, their distances. And then we're able to now understand a subset of how they kind of, you know, uh, defer in different um, uh, in different regions of the in different regions of the brain, um, so this is again a small section of an entire mouse brain, uh, but that's not giving us the entire picture. So what we decided to do is go smaller in terms of the organism. So here we're imaging flies, uh, and the fly brain that we're imaging here is roughly the same size as the volume that I that I've uh, imaged in the in the mouse brain. But the cool thing is that we're able to capture the entire fly brain. Uh, so in this case, uh, we're imaging the entire fly brain, but we're only looking at the dopaminergic neurons. And we're looking at the synapses that are associated with these dopaminergic neurons. And the amazing thing about this technology is that uh, people have tried to you know, image uh, the synaptic positions uh, in the fly brain of very specific uh, regions. So this is called um, the mushroom body, which is responsible for memory and learning in flies. Um, it took um, uh, them about a year and a half to do the three-dimensional EM imaging of this. Uh, and then it took them an additional 10,000 human hours to be able to annotate these data sets, uh, to be able to display the positions of every single synapse um, in this particular uh, region of the brain. So that's roughly about two years of work uh, to map one one hundredth of the fly brain. So if the question is to map the synaptic positions, we can have uh, molecular markers uh, to be able to image them. Uh, but what we do is um, before we know whether it works in our case or not, we mapped in this particular really dense region what the distribution um, of these synapses is. And we find that it's more or less about 250 nanometers um, at the mode of, these, of this distribution. And we have uh, better than about 60 nanometer resolution. So we really are able to capture almost all of these and differentiate them as, as different synaptic positions. So by using, again, our com combination of expansion and lattice, we're able to now not just map um, uh, just in a small region, but we were able to map synapses in the entire fly brain. So that's about 40 million synapses that have been counted directly from this fly brain. And we were able to do this in more or less under a week, so to speak. Um, 
And um, the cool thing is we're not just able to do, you know, uh, counting of these, of these synaptic positions, but we're now starting to ask uh, more fundamental questions, but with molecular level detail, which is, well, what is the, the, the difference between, say, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere? Um, are there differences in the, in the synaptic connections um, or the density of these connections in the different regions of the brain? We're asking differences, uh, we're starting to ask questions about how does this vary over age or um, over disease models like Alzheimer's and things like that. So with that, I'm gonna stop. Um, and I do want to kind of go over some of the challenges and the technical parts in terms of the data. Uh, but before I do, everything I've shown you has been an amazing um, uh, teamwork from basically, you know, uh, like, like several different uh, groups. Um, and so from, from my postdoctoral work, uh, it was with uh, Tom Kirkhausen, but I worked very closely with um, Eric Betzig uh, and his group at Janelia. Uh, Sung Lee was the one who first um, built uh, the prototype for the, uh, the adaptive optics lattice light sheet. Dan Milkey is our, um, more or less our, our god when it comes to control software to be able to work the instruments and push, to, you know, push them to their limits. Um, and uh, we work with all of the zebrafish work with um, the Megason Lab at Harvard Medical School. Uh, particularly, Ian is the one who's generated all of the uh, the zebrafish, um, the actual reagents that I've, I've shown you. Uh, and Ed Boyden's lab at MIT, uh, we work with them on the combination of this um, of the lattice light sheet with uh, expansion microscopy, uh, specifically with um, with Show and Ray. And uh, the next basically group, the Stefan Sawfels group, they've been our computational stitching pipeline uh, gods, so to speak. Uh, they were basically able to generate these, um, uh, these Java tools to be able to more or less uh, stitch literally tens or hundreds of terabytes of, of data uh, using the Genelia clusters. Um, so with that, I'm gonna uh, kind of tell you what we're up to next and what our challenges are. So in the context of super resolution, uh, everything I've shown you was uh, what we're calling last gen uh, expansion. Uh, it took us about three days to be able to image the whole fly brain. Uh, but with what we built at uh, Berkeley today, uh, with the current technology, what we're calling it, where it used to be called next gen, but now it's, it's operational, so it's current. Uh, it'll take us about two hours to image that same thing. So we're about 50 times faster than we were before. But as you can see, if you want to get to the entire fly brain, it'll still take you over 50 years uh, for the old generation to, to image the entire, um, uh, the entire uh, fly brain at the, re the resolution level that I've shown you. And the bigger problem is uh, the data size. That's about 200 petabytes of, of data for about two channels. And to give you some sort of like context to EM, um, for them to do one millimeter cubed imaging using the three-dimensional FIPSIM will take about 300 years. And I guess I, uh, we shouldn't even discuss the, the, the mouse brain problem at this point with the, with the FIPSIM because that's definitely beyond our lifetimes. Um, and more or less our challenges come from uh, first handling the data, which is uh, mainly re related to data production rates. So these instruments typically are not on 24 seven just because we have no way of dealing with the data. So we basically have to do surgical experiments, uh, which really prohibit our ability to explore and more or less kind of, you know, try to, to go in without a hypothesis and then to use the data to generate a hypothesis. So that's a, a problem. The second problem is um, a computational tools. Uh, and the challenge there is that the diversity of biological samples that go in um, to a fluorescence microscope um, is, is, is immense, meaning that the type of sample is different, uh, the levels of signals are different, the features that we're trying to identify are very dependent on what is tagged and labeled. So that basically makes generalization um, uh, more or less challenging and generalizing it broad enough um, is also extremely um, uh, difficult. And then uh, the future more or less um, in terms of breakthroughs really require interdisciplinary teams. So the only reason I've been successful the past few years um, is because I was able to work with an amazing group of interdisciplinary um, experts. So I had virologists, cell biologists, software engineers. Um, uh, we basically had data scientists basically as working together on a single problem um, at the same time at Genelia. And that was basically the result that you've seen uh, right now. And I think um, 
to scale cell biology or to scale life sciences um, to have this type of impact really does require um, having uh, teams that are embedded with, with, um, with uh, a lot of uh, complementing expertise. So in that sense, we're really open to collaborating at any level that's of interest um, to, to folks that want to work with us. Uh, and to give you an example, we've had uh, collaborations where we just give the data because you know, they're trying to build a new infrastructure for how you more or less store or read or, or write the data. We've had collaborations where uh, they're trying to build new tools to be able to segment uh, different things because, you know, these are the levels of details that were never, I mean, these type of data sets never existed before. So we try to share these as broadly as possible. And, and the more extreme cases, you know, we pick a few problems uh, and then we work more or less hand in hand together. Um, uh, to, and, and, that, and that's basically um, our, our, and we're open to all of these things um, at, um, with, with ABC at Berkeley. Um, so to give you context of, of data scales, um, the last two projects, um, sorry, I'm going to skip this part. The last two projects that we worked on, which is the adaptive optics and the, and the expansion lattice, that was about three quarters of a petabyte. And this is literally just one group of people um, with several collaborators, but it's about four different people working on, on both of these projects, more or less, to push them uh, from the start to the end. Um, and that really was only possible because we had the biologists, the imaging specialists, and the data scientists working together at the same place at the same time. And this is what we're trying to emulate um, at the Advanced Bioimaging Center. So I'm happy to stop there and, and take any questions. All right. Uh, thank you, Gokul. And uh, we have some time to go through the questions, if any. I think Hans has asked uh, can you talk about a bit about your computing needs approach analyzing visualizing tps of 3d time region data so some of it has been answered but hans do you have any further question so actually uh, that's a good <clears throat> point um so i think i, I well the, the problem is data generation rate because we're able to generate um actually i'm sorry let me go back a little bit starting at the very beginning so we're in the barker hall um we're more or less, I feel like, building a mausoleum inside of Barker in the sense that you can see the, the line width of the, the network connection going from, from Barker to, to the Berkeley IT core. And that's about one gig, but I think they recently upgraded to 10 gig. Uh, our data outputs from the AO SWAC that I'm calling over there, those are the microscopes. Um, they generate data at close to you know, 30 to 40 gigabits a second, and we have two of these microscopes. So more or less, um, we're kind of getting buried in data there. Um, and then um, the data storage problem, meaning that this is uncompressed uh, with practical duty cycles. So we're talking about this in the context of um, what we've actually done in the past and then projecting based on and what we're planning to do next. Uh, and the good thing is our data is highly compressible because most of it is empty, meaning that it's just dark. Uh, so that basically means that we generate anywhere from half a petabyte to a petabyte of compressed data. Uh, and the last two projects took about um, 3 million CPU hours per year uh, to get through the computations. Um, and we've only been able to do that because we had the luxury of, of the Harvard cluster available to us. We had the luxury of having Genelia cluster, which you know is like 5,000 nodes with literally only 10 people using it, including us. So that was uh, basically what facilitated that. And um, sorry, I'm gonna skip a little bit ahead just to kind of talk about our main problems. Um, so in terms of the, I mean, not including the, the, the control software, I'm just now talking about what comes out of the microscope and what we're trying to mine. Uh, there's these commercial and visualization tools um, that are kind of exist, but not really designed for this scale of data. Um, and that is one challenge. Uh, the open source tools, um, they work uh, as a solution, but most of it, what we do is Python, MATLAB, C++. Uh, and the unfortunate thing is that this is not biologist friendly, meaning that we can write a tool, but, and we can put that on GitHub. Uh, but you know, most of that, more or less, those tools have been kind of developed with a particular data set in mind. And when they, you know, others want to reuse them, they may not have the expertise to be able to take that and, and modify it as they're, you know, to, to fit their needs. And uh, the last is, 
um, how do we do a scalable and automated AI solutions for this type of data? I mean that we have incredible amounts of data sets. Uh, we can start to generate labeled data sets for different types of problems um, with different, you know, SNRs with different um, to basically mimic the diversity of samples that can come up with. And this is something that I think we're ex super excited uh, to be at Berkeley to explore with with collaborations on how to kind of get this uh, working.